Take your Bible and turn to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Sounds like a good place to start. Don't know where in the world we're going to end up, but that's a good place to start. Jeremiah chapter 17. See, there's something that you and I need to always remember. And I'm going to help you with something. I've done this before, but, you, you know, it's theological mucilage. It kind of helps you. Because there are certain things that I have learned years ago, and it kind of helped me as I go through life. Because we need to just walk on our journey with the Lord. But there's things to keep in mind, because on this journey are these things that's going to happen to you. And if you know what's going to happen, you're kind of prepared for it. And it doesn't have to shock you so bad. And, uh, but if I was just to give you, say, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, you can remember that. You already know that, right? All right, so all you need to know is what those numbers mean. Like 1, run, 2, zoo, 3, tree, 4, door, 5, hive, 6, 6, 7, heaven, 8, gate, 9, wine, 10, den. So you got that, right? So you just remembered that. 1 is run. They rhyme. See how easy that is? 1, run. 2, zoo. 3, tree. 4, door. 5, hive. 6, sick. 7, heaven. 8, gate. 9, wine. 10, den. See how simple it is to remember something when you relate it to something or if it sounds the same. Have you ever noticed that sometimes whenever people write songs, they try to get certain words to rhyme? Sometimes people write songs and nothing rhymes. And they write poems. I, I like to do a little bit of all of that. But when it comes to sermons, sometimes you outline and you have certain words that starts the same way with the same letter. You know, it sounds the same or something. They're just memory pegs so that you can remember where you are. And so sometimes it helps, not all the time, because we're human. We all have failures and memory lapses and so on. But I want you to see this here in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17. A principle to learn from God's word is this simple little principle in verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Now, we have to, you know, go through life trusting people, but it ought not be that which is your strength. Your strength is in the arm of the Lord, and you trust the Lord because that should be the overriding factor. If you find that men don't always agree with God, well, who are you going to agree with? Are you going to choose to agree with man or God? You always side with the Lord. This is, number one, run, and there's something running, and it's a horse. You see the horse? You see the horse running? One, run, horse running. And on the back of the horse is whatever it is you need to remember, and it's your attitude. So you see a proud man with a good attitude. I remember one time I was at one of the Dare to Share meetings, and Rick Long, one of the guys that came from our Christian school, he was in charge of their music and some of their skits. And so they did a song, and I don't remember what the name of the song was, but it, he says, all right, all you kids, and there was about you know, five, 6,000 kids there. And so he walks across the stage. He says, what you've got to have is an attitude. He says, let me see your attitude. And the kids had no clue what he's talking about. Show me your attitude. So he says, this is not a good attitude. He says, I want you to have an attitude. You know, an attitude. And then walk like you got an attitude. Now, I remember some of my kids when they used to have an attitude, and I had to knock it out of them. But there's good positive attitudes to have because it deals with the way you see life. And it's your attitude, how you think about things. Uh, look what it says down in verse 7. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river. See, now this is what you want. You want to be a good tree planted by some water where you can get the strength and the nourishment you need at all times so that you can bear fruit in season, out of season. You're always the same, and you've got beautiful foliage on your tree. So this, but it deals with your attitude on what you're trusting in. And it shows whenever you're down and discouraged and despaired, you do know that's a sign you're trusted in you. That's why you think that way. That's why it's such a destructive thing. But if you learn to have the positive attitude God wants you to have, it changes everything. 
Well, look what he says there in verse 9. See, verse 9 is a verse you ought to underline in your Bible. It's talking about that old sinful nature that you have within you. You ought to understand you can't trust you because of this old sinful nature. It will deceive you and lie to you. The Word of God will not. The heart is deceitful above all things. There's nothing more deceitful than the heart that you have. That old sinful nature you have. He is a liar and a deceiver. And he says, and desperately wicked, who can know it or understand it? But the Lord searches the heart. Now take your Bible and turn all the way over there to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah and chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26. And this is on page 735. And uh, there's two verses here that I've given to you before, and it deals an awful lot with this. So, number one, run. And whatever it is you see, somebody sitting in that saddle that's got a good attitude. A good attitude. And as you go through life, you want to be the one that has a good attitude. Because, you see, it reveals your perspective in life. Now, if you'll look at this verse here in Isaiah 26, look in verse 3. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. When people watch you or look at you, do they see a peaceful man or a worried man all the time? Or a man of fear? What do they see? Do you think people read you? Yes, they read you. And you don't have to say anything, but sometimes people can tell when you have a problem, right? Because sometimes we wear, and it's on our countenance. Sometimes you can't change it, and you don't need to. You need to be real. Sometimes there's times of grief, and there are heartaches, and there are things like that. But I don't believe that it should be all your life. It ought not be the, the overriding signature of your life as a frown. But you ought to have a positive attitude because it's a biblical attitude, and it's so important. Look at number four, verse four. It says, Trust in the Lord Jehovah, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. That's where you get your strength from and your joy from. Now, number two is zoo, and whatever you want is inside that cage. You ever been to a zoo? Well, whatever you want's inside that cage, see. And in that cage, well, whatever it is, it's what you want. And there's a sign that says, have goal, will travel. Remember I told you one time I used to watch this old cowboy movie, Paladin, have gun, will travel. Oh, I'd have loved to have been there. You know, something like that. Just go around and shoot people, you know. <laughs> But, but that's my old nature now. I don't always understand it. That's my old nature that does that. Now, new nature wouldn't think like that. My old nature did. And so, have goal will travel. What it simply means is, is you have to have a purpose in life. So as you live your life, you have to have a right kind of an attitude that you're going to trust the Lord. Whatever's out there, wherever you're going, whatever you're going to be, you're going to trust the Lord. And because of that, you want to find out what is the purpose that God has for my life. What is my goal in life? And so, as I study the Word of God, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, about being a tree of life. All these wonderful statements that we have in learning to glorify the Lord, and He's glorified when you bear much fruit and so on. So there's a lot of verses that talks about things like that, but just you've got to have that purpose, that drive in your life. Now, number three is tree. See, there's a tree. And whatever it is you want to remember is hanging on that tree. And it's planning for profit. You're planning for profit. Because you see, a tree comes from one little apple seed, and next thing you know, you get an apple tree that bears apples every year. A thousand apples from one little tree. You want to be prosperous. You want to be productive. You want to have results from living your life. Uh, once in a while, and I did it in Sunday school this morning, just to share with you a, a few little contacts here and note years ago, and then you get some of the, the profit back. And they become the joy that you have later on in life. But you have to understand that you have to do something every day toward your goal. You've got to know what it is, and then you've got to work toward it and get there. I was going to come down here because I was going to write me some books. Guess how many books I've written since I've been here? <laughs> None. But my goal has not changed. It's still there. And I know that sooner or later, if God tarries and I have some time, I'm going to work on me a couple books. I've got a great ideas. Uh, my mind is never 
stops. It's just always planning. I, I, in the middle of the night, I'm dreaming or I'm, I'm, I'm preaching sermons or I'm coming up with a, a song here or a poem or something. Always being productive. Plan for profit. Something that will help you accomplish what you want in life. How to reach your, your goal. And so that's what you always have to do. So that's number three. So you know what number one is. One is run, and run is the attitude that's sitting in the back of the horse. You saw that there. Number two is zoo, and there's that little cage, and whatever it is you're after is going to be in there. And so you have gold. We'll travel. And then you got three, tree, and you got a tree, and then lo and behold, uh, it's planning for profit because that's a fruitful tree. That's what you want to be. You want to be a tree of life. You want to have somebody that you lead to the Lord, that leads somebody to the Lord, that leads somebody to the Lord. I believe that's what he's talking about when he talks about, and your fruit shall remain. So number four is door. Four is door. But the four door, uh, well, that's, that's thinking big. Thinking big. God opening the door of opportunity. And I live all the time believing. I don't know when. I don't know how. But I know God is going to open up the door of opportunity for me. And all I want to do is make sure that I, I step through the door. And I don't use some things as an excuse, like old age or something like that. If I believe God's in it, I want to do it. And so you've got to have this goal in your mind. I want to not only plan for profit. I want something big. I want God to do something big. And so that's why... It's number four, door. Think big. Look at it this way. Attempt great things for God. Expect great things from God. But if you don't do anything for the Lord, don't expect anything from the Lord. You see, you have to be willing to do what God wants you to do in order to get what you dream about. And God says, be it unto you according to your faith. The rewards we talked about this morning... Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his works, according, according to your faith, according to your work. So in other words, something is in direct ratio to the caliber of the mind and the actions. God does this, and we're supposed to know this and understand it, and that's what really helps us. So you want to plan for profit, and you are expecting God to open up doors of opportunity. So you want to think big. Because you see, how big is your God? If you have a little God, well then you'll accomplish little things. If you have a big God, then you can have big confidence because I know my God can do this and this and this. But a lot of Christians think their God is so small. God can't do this and God can't do that and God can't deliver and God can't provide. And, and they were because they got a little God. I told a student one time, I said, take a dime. So they took a dime in their hand. I says, now, look at it out there. I says, can you still see the room? Sure, you can see the room. You see everything in that room. It's just a little small speck. And everything looks big. And this little dime looks small. I says, now, put it real close to your eye. To where you don't see anything but the dime. I says, see, the dime is still the same size. But it's your perspective. You're closer to it. And the closer you get to God, the bigger God looks to you. And the bigger your faith will be. The greater the confidence you're going to have. And you'd be surprised the difference it can make in your life. Now, number five, hive. You think of a, a beehive. You ever seen a beehive? I've seen a beehive. I've had bees come after me, too. To be or not to be. Stung. And there's a beehive. And what comes out of a beehive? bees. And does it produce fear or joy? Fear. So fear, number five, is fear. Fear is what is your greatest robber of success, of being what God wants you to be, or doing what God wants, because you're afraid. And that's why when you read the scriptures, God's always talking about be strong and very courageous. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. Fear not. Why? Because we're afraid. But fear is not to keep us from doing what God says to do. Courage is fear that says its prayers and goes ahead. Fear is courage. Or courage is fear that says its prayers and goes ahead. And so perfect love casts out fear. 
But many of God's children never accomplish with their life what they're supposed to accomplish because they are afraid of or afraid. That's why you need to learn to trust in the Lord. Because when you trust in yourself, you don't have the confidence you ought to have. Because you don't have the ability you ought to have. But in the hands of God, you'd be surprised what God can do for you and with you and through you. And so your confidence increases when the object of your trust is in the right place. So number six is sick. So you think of a hospital and somebody in the hospital. And you want to go to the hospital to see this person that's sick. And what it means is, is be a go-giver. In other words, we went to the hospital to see a little girl. And aren't we glad we went? I believe because we did, Mama showed up with Mama, Grandma, and a little boy. All because we showed interest in the little girl. Sometimes, you know, you never know how things are going to work. But if you want something, you have to plant first. You see, when you have a garden, God doesn't give you the fruit and then say plant the seed. You see, you plant the seed, and then you water it, and then watch it grow. But you have to go and do the work first, and then you get the results. So first of all, be a person that takes the initiative. Take initiative. Have you ever seen people in church... And we have, it's time to greet one another. And some people are just afraid to greet anybody. They, no, they just, they can't get out of that shell. Some of the people are slowly, they're coming out of it. You know, this is one of the things that helps the people more than anything else. Because they feel, if everybody else is doing it, they feel like I ought to also. And they learn to be friendly and to smile. They meet somebody they don't even know. And so it, it's a good thing. It's a, 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 joy, a joyful thing. But uh, take the initiative. A soul winner. Should we wait for the lost man to come to us, or should we go to the lost man? I know this is a difficult question. Very difficult. We go to the lost man. Christ said, go ye into all the world. We, that we, we obey first, and then let God bless. Lord, bless me first, and then I'll decide if I want to do it. Do you do that with the boss where you work? You pay me first, and then I'll decide if I want to work. I, I don't think he wants to do it that way. He probably wants you to go to the work, and then you might get paid, and that'll help. So you've got to do it first, and you trust. Now, that's number six. So you know that the principle is laid down there, and so just by remembering one, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven, heaven. See, that rhymes. Doesn't it rhyme? Seven and heaven rhymes. So heaven is, you picture a guy climbing this ladder's only way to heaven, and he's all excited. But you see, when you climb up that ladder to go to heaven, you don't want to go by yourself. You want to bring a whole bunch of people with you. It's kind of like climbing a mountain. You know, when you get to the top, it's so good to have somebody to share the experience with. This is one of the things that's joyful about, you know, a husband and a wife, you know, going through life together. And then when you get old, you remember all the things you've gone through and how good God's been to you and what he's brought you through. But who wants to get there alone? Now, we know that the day may come where God may take one and one of them's going to stay. Betty keeps telling me we're going to go together. And I said, well, the Lord may want to just take one of us. No, we're both going together. Oh, boy. Lord, I hope it's in the rapture. <laughs> but anyway, however we get there. But number seven is heaven. And it deals with the thing called enthusiasm. You can't light a candle with an unlit candle. If you want to be excited, then you're going to have to get your excitement from some place because after a while you burn out. You ever heard about people being burned out? I'm just burnt out. Well, stay close to the flame. Talk about the Lord. Pretend like the verses in the Bible are, are logs that you put on the fire. And so, you see, when you read this verse and you put the log on the fire then it keeps it burning. And whenever people start getting cold, I know they've stopped putting wood on the fire. It means they're not in the Word. The Word of God is like a what? Fire. It's like a fire. It burns. Like Jeremiah said, it burned inside of me. And so there is a fire that's caused by the Word of God. And it can keep you on fire so that you want to keep serving the Lord all the days of your life. 
But you see, that's where your, your enthusiasm comes. A lot of people think that they get joy of the Lord by osmosis. In other words, if you're filled with joy, if I just get close to you and rub up against you, all that joy is going to leak over into my body, and now I'm happy and excited. You've got to get it from the Lord because people change. And if you're happy only because you're hanging around happy people, well, what happens when they're no longer happy? Now what happens to yours? But see, God doesn't change. And you want personal joy, personal strength, personal happiness. You want it because of your walk with the Lord. So it will help you. But that, that's number seven. No, number eight is gate. And gate is, well, you always know a gate is because of, there's a pasture on the other side. You know, it's always greener on the other side, but the pasture is your environment. It's where you live. And so your environment is so important. Did you know that if I come to church and I meet with God's people on a regular basis, and we spend some time together, and I get to know you, you get to know me, and we can talk and share and encourage one another and pray for one another, did you realize that environment will keep me stronger? But if I go to the wrong places with the wrong people, did you realize that they are going to affect me? I'm not going to affect them. They're going to affect me. If I took a white glove and threw it into the mud, is the mud going to become glovey or is the glove going to become muddy? Let me repeat that. Some of you aren't paying attention. I got a pearly white glove. If I throw it in the mud, what gets affected, the mud or the glove? And so you as a Christian are supposed to watch your testimony. The people that you hang around. If you want to be strong or wise, seek wise counseling. Hang around with the people that you should. And your strength will be increased. But if you hang around with the wrong people, going to the wrong places, you're going to wind up doing the wrong thing, and you're going to find out that you're going to have a lot of trouble and heartache, more than you would have had. So you need to be careful and guard your environment. That's why I want to try to get people, always be faithful to come to church. Always be faithful to come. Do you know all these years, 51 years since I trusted Christ, nobody has ever tried or had to encourage me to go to church. When the doors are open, I'm there. I'm always going. I always think it's the best thing to do. It's the best thing for my testimony. Now, unless I'm in a place where I can't get there or something like that, but it's natural part of my life. This is what I do. And I, I, just, I just can't stand it when I'm not where I'm supposed to be because it's, it's just... It's the way you are. It's part of your character. But anyway, number nine, wine. You drink wine or strong drink, what happens to you? You're going to get drunk. You're not going to have a straight path for your feet. It means you're going to stumble. It means that you're going to have what we call, I guess, you know, a stumbling block. Climbing a mountain... It's not the big boulders that cause you to lose your footing. It's the loose pebbles. The loose pebbles. The little bitty things you don't think is important is what causes us to slip and slide. We're not going to slide because of big decisions. It's going to be those little bitty ones that we don't think are that important. Little bitty things in our life that we let go. Little bitty sins that we don't think, well, they're not that big. It's not that bad. And so we trip over this and slide over this. The next thing you know, you're sliding down the mountain. You're falling. You're not going to reach your purpose or your goal. And then you'll wonder why. And sometimes it could be because of little decisions you make in your life that you didn't think it would matter that much. But it will. And so, number ten, den. And I, I, I think it's important. To, when you think of a den, I want you to think of a, a bear coming out of, that, out of that den. When you see that bear coming out of that den... What do you think of doing? Run. It's called run away emotions. You ever have emotions that run away with you? Run away emotions. And so this is what causes people to lead them to compromise. You see, that bear that came out of that, why does he want to eat you up? Because he's hungry. Why is this hunter looking for this bear? Because he wants a fur coat. All they got to do is compromise. Let the bear eat the hunter, and that way the hunter got a fur coat, and the bear, he, well, he, he, he got him a full meal. And they both are happy. Right? Now some people don't see anything wrong with that. 
But when you see that bear coming out of that mountain, you want to run. You want to flee. And this is what happens whenever you have an undisciplined mind will cause you to have runaway emotions. And you will live controlled by the fear and the anguish and the despair and all the things that comes with the sins of the mind because you don't have control. But remember this. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed anchored. But a runaway mind because of runaway emotions that dealt by feelings and so forth, and the things that you see and can't control, those things are going to destroy you. So you have those ten little simple things that you can remember, can't you? You can remember that? Number one, run, two, zoo, three, tree, four, door, five, hive, six, six, seven, heaven, eight, gate, nine, wine, ten, den. And number one, what do you see? You see a horse, right? And in it, the saddle is, is an attitude. And you got a good attitude, right? So when you start off the new year, why not just decide, I'm going to have a good attitude this year because of my perspective. I'm going to look at every problem that I have, every testing that I have, as an opportunity from God for me to do something for Him. It means God has something special for me. He got a lesson He wants me to learn. There might be an attitude problem that I got I need to deal with. But it's going to be a positive thing. And you're not going to go through life whining and pining about everything that goes wrong. Everybody can do that. The lost man can do that. Let the lost man be the one that does all the worrying and then falling apart and any emotional upheaval. But not the Christian. The Christian's supposed to be different. He has the Lord. Isn't that right? I mean, we say that, but we don't really believe that, do we? We should. And so number two, zoo. Have gold, we'll travel. You've got a purpose in life. You know what God wants to do with your life. And number three, three you're planning for profit. You're going to do every day something that brings you closer to your goal. And you say, I want to please the Lord. I want to have fruit. I want people to be in heaven because they heard the gospel through my lips. And so every day I know that that's a purpose, a goal in my life. That's why i got to have tracks. i got to have tracks for me. Some people can go around and they never carry tracks. I thought, it's like living in the Wild West days and going out without a six gun. You just got to have preparation. But anyway, at number four, door. Think big, act big, do big. Because you got a big God. And so you expect God to do something. That's why you pray. You see, a lot of people don't pray because they don't think God's going to do anything anyway. And so number five, hive, bees, fear. So you got this fear that you need to deal with. The fear of being a failure. The fear of quitting. The fear of people laughing at you. This is what stops a lot of people from using some of the talents and abilities they've got for the Lord. Because they feel like, well, they always compare themselves with somebody else. Well, they can do a better job than me. And, and they're so much better than I am. Stop the comparison. Let God use you. However he wants to. But do it. Number six, be a go-giver. You see that person laying in the hospital? You're going to go visit. You don't want nothing back. You just want to give. And see, if you, if you never worry about who gets the credit, you can always do a great job. But a lot of people only do a great job if they can get credit for it. And they want to make sure that I get all the credit I'm supposed to be is due to me. And if I don't, and then I get jealous and I'm getting bitter and I'm going to be filled with angry, envy and jealousy and, uh, and hatred. And, and Look, you're going to do it for the Lord. Do it for the Lord. If you're doing it for show, do it for show. Say so. I'm doing this just to be recognized so I can let everybody know who I God called those people in the Bible, the Pharisees. He said, you hypocrites. That's why you do what you do. They do it to be seen of men. But you're not doing it to just to be seen of men. Because you see, you're a Christian. You're doing it for the Lord. And you know if God sees it, God's going to reward you. And you don't have to worry about it, do you? See, it all has to deal with your attitude toward these things. And so number seven, you're going to fill with excitement. You want the Lord to use you because you want to be a blessing to others. You want to be a channel that God can use and reach other people because of it. And number eight is gate. And gate deals with your environment. And you're going to discipline yourself and you make sure you stay away from the people who destroy you and pull you down. People that are not right for you. It's one thing to try to reach the people with the gospel. Try to influence them in the right way. But you've got to watch that they're not one, being the one that influences you. 
You see, if there's a man down in a hole, I don't mind reaching down and try to help pull that man up, but I don't need to get down in there with him. Just because he's laying in the mud don't mean I have to go lay in the mud. So God wants you to be separate and yet have a heart of compassion where we care. You'll help people longer if you'll do right and be strong. And so number nine, wine, confusion, stumbling. You ever notice a lot of Christians, they stumble? And so if you want to be careful, then you'll have to be, well, walk circumspectly. Remember like the long-tailed cat on the fence with barking dogs on both sides? you got to watch your step. And so that means you don't want to become a stumbling block to somebody else. God says to be sober-minded, sober-minded. And number 10, den. You see that bear coming out of that den after you? And that runaway emotions, oh my stars. And because it's a sign of an undisciplined mind. So you and I are supposed to learn how to think. And there's simple little things that you don't have to remember, number one, number two. Like, you just know the principle that's there. And as you live tomorrow and the next day and the next day, it helps to guide you to know what, these are some things that can help me in my Christian life in walking with the Lord. In case somebody's listening by internet, I want to show you something that you might never have seen before. Look up here. This hand represents you and me. And the wallet represents sin. We all have sin on us. But God loves us. Oh, he hates our sin, but he loves us. I just got a, an email from a young girl that came to our ranch. She was about 15 years old. Her name was Nancy Jackson. And this is back in the 70s. She came out. She trusted Christ as her Savior. And she um, wound up going to our camps and, and then the college and then taught in the Christian school. Married a guy, Wayne Patterson. Had some kids. And this last week, she sent out an email that her relative had died. A parent, a father, I think it was. And uh, she let me know that she was, said, and I got it yesterday. When I got back, I opened it up, and there it was. She said, I'm so thankful that every time my parents were there, you gave the gospel. You gave the gospel. They heard the gospel. And see, now, you know, 30, 40 years later, they're thankful that for that one little thing that you just took it for granted, that, you know, everybody's heard that a thousand times. People might be watching and may trust Christ as Savior. You don't know. I've lived long enough to see. Just keep planting seeds. You don't know what's going to grow. You don't know who's listening. And I, and I always believe that there's a door. And I don't know how many is on the other side of that door. But God loves us. But he hates our sin. And for us to go to heaven, we have to be perfect, as righteous as God. And none of us are perfect. We've all sinned and come short of God's perfection. God says, you and I, we can't save ourselves. It's not by our works. So God says that um, he would do something for us we couldn't do. This hand represents Jesus Christ. He's God in the flesh. He came into the world because he loves us. He hates our sin because our sin separates us from the Lord. So Jesus Christ, who had no sin, didn't have to die. He came into the world, took all the sins of the world, paid for them on the cross, and came back from the dead. And God said that if we would believe that he did it for us, he would put this payment to our account, and we get to go to heaven on what he did. That's a free gift. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. Best news in all the world. Let's pray, shall we? With heads bowed, eyes closed, and no one looking around, if you're here tonight or listening by internet, understand the most important thing you can ever do, the greatest decision you'll ever make, is to believe that when Christ died, he died for you. Will you believe that he did it? He did do it. He came. He died and paid for your sins. Will you believe he paid for yours? And God said if you'll believe he did it for you, he would give you as a free gift, everlasting life. And friend, I pray that you will. Our Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We ask your blessings upon this church, all the people, the individuals, every family. And help us, Lord, to be the kind of people you want us to be. And there's a lot of things that we're going to have to face in the coming days. 
even as a nation, as things happen around the world, we don't know at what point our whole lives will be interrupted and what's going to be the cause of it, what's going to happen to us. But Father, we know that we are in your hands and we can trust you for a day, a week, a month, a year, our whole lives. Cursed is the man who putteth his confidence in man, but the man who puts his trust in you is guaranteed the peace, the joy, the strength. So thank you so much for this time together.